Good morning. What a beautiful day to be starting this celebration of the 4th of July weekend. And we just thank the Lord for this and for the many blessings that he's given us and for this country, even though it's a little mixed up and confused at times, but uh, it still is a great country and it's just a great place to live and to raise our children and grandchildren. <clears throat> okay, the announcements for this week. Uh, remind everyone the semi-annual business meeting is coming up already. It's going to be next Sunday the 10th. Uh, so, <clears throat> and there's going to be uh, a lunch after the uh, worship service and we need people to get signed up uh, for a dish that you're going to bring. Otherwise, we'll be starving. And we don't want to come to the business meeting with all of our stomachs growling. So be sure you get signed up for that if you haven't already. Okay, and the West Portland Baptist Church Family Night at the Ballpark. That's coming up as well. The Jamestown Tarp Skunks baseball game. That's Sunday the 17th, 4 o'clock. And that's at the Jamestown Russell Dietrich Park. Be sure you see Pam. Uh, to get your tickets if you haven't already. Okay, the adult volleyball returns to the activity center on July 14th from 6 to 8. A uh, good time for those that love to play volleyball. Sunday night, kids fun nights on July 31st is going to be for ages 3 through 7. And then on Sunday, August 14th, will be for the older kids ages 8 through 12. They're both at 6 o'clock. Backyard Bible Studies, going to be July 24th, August 7th, and August 28th at 6 o'clock. We always enjoy having those times of fellowship and getting together in somebody's backyard. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, and if you would like to host one of those nights, be sure you get signed up. And then the Sunday School Church Picnic is good going to be Sunday afternoon, August 21st at the KOA. Always a good time. Just mark it on your calendar so you be sure you remember. Thank you. If everything works out correctly, that will be the last picnic at KOA. No offense to KOA, but we hope by next summer to have a pavilion out here. So uh, uh, Frank's already got plans on what he's going to be cooking or something for that, for, the, for next year's Sunday school picnic. But uh, we, will, we always enjoy going to KOA. It's always a good time. Uh, if you would also note, uh, not in your bulletin, our missionaries, Ellie and Sonia, uh, who live in Hartfield, DeWittville area, there is a benefit lawn sale for uh, their work in their ministry coming up next Friday and Saturday at Stacy Klossner's house, which is 6485 East Lake Road up in Hartfield. So if you're interested in that, there's a lawn sale there, and all the proceeds at that lawn sale are going to uh, the work in Africa, which right now, because they are not able to actually go back and forth from America to Africa, uh, right now is to support building church buildings and some of the physical things that are going on in the ministries in Africa. So uh, that's not in the bulletin, but if you would like to do that, feel free to go up there and look around at what's at that lawn sale. Also, uh, the, the annual meeting next week, the semi-annual meeting, there, the sign-up sheet's on the board. The meat and dessert is provided. So you're actually signing up for the uh, side dishes. So there's a list of different type of side dishes. I see a few sign-ups. Uh, some of you folks who are away this week are going to have a hard time signing up. They're not here to be here or to sign up. But for those of you who are here, uh, sign up and we'll uh, have a good time of lunch and then have a quick business meeting. Then that's coming up next Sunday already. So take note of that. Uh, those are the announcements. We do have several prayer requests that are on our list still and things we're still praying for, and we certainly trust the Lord for. You have a list that's in your bulletin. Take it with you and certainly pray for these things, not just today as we pray together, but also as we go through this week, we remember some of these needs, and we'll come to the Lord now this morning to pray and ask God to provide for these. So let's join together. Father, we do thank you for your blessing of answered prayer. That we who are your children, your people, are in the scripture uh, not only just asked to come, but we're told that we need to come. And it doesn't take us very long as believers to figure out how badly we need to come to you. We need your strength. We need your answers. We are insufficient. We are unable. 
And as you look down a list or as we look at our own hearts and the needs that we have around us, it becomes very clear if we truly think about it how we are so uh, not able to provide for the things that we pray for. And so we come to you today praying for physical needs, for healing to difficult situations, for healing to things that aren't perhaps as difficult but certainly challenging, uh, for those who have long-term needs, be it cancer or something else, for those who have shorter-term needs, recoveries that are going uh, from surgeries or illnesses or injuries. We just look to you for the provisions that we need in our bodies. We look to you for the provisions we need in our souls and our spirits, uplifting, upholding. Some days it can be very easy to be discouraged, to, to feel poorly just looking around perhaps at our circumstances or our situations and to become very bogged down and drained underneath those situations we face. But help us, dear God, that we might not be, that we might be encouraged and strengthened as we're believers in Christ to, to be inspired to look to you and to see the potential of what you can do, even for the things that we pray for. We ask for the needs of our country, and on this Independence Day weekend, we are reminded uh, of the needs that we have as a land and as a nation. We look around and see that those needs as our land are quite similar to the needs of this world. But we certainly pray for those who lead our country, both nationally, locally, at a state level, that they might have your guidance, your wisdom, your understanding in the decisions that are being made, that you might also uh, do a work in this land that we live in spiritually. We see the great lack of spirituality, the lack of faith, the lack of belief, the lack of trust in Christ. And it breaks our heart to know that there are countless people wandering through their, their earthly existence without a thought nor a hope of eternity. And so we pray for our country spiritually. We pray that you would minister to the needs of uh, those who serve our country in the military. Keep them in your care, your safety. Pray that you would be with our missionaries who serve around this world, a few who serve in America, but many who serve in other nations. As we take the word of God to this world, and not just to our homeland, we pray that uh, wherever we take the word of God through the support of missionaries, that they might do your work and be encouraged in the work and be strengthened in the work. And we pray that you would use them uh, greatly whatever country place they be found in. We're thankful again for uh, the goodness you give us as Americans. Uh, there is many blessings, in spite of the faults, many blessings being in this land. And we certainly thank you for the freedom we have this morning to gather here. The freedom to be able to not have to hide in our worship, not have to be concerned at authorities, perhaps driving through a parking lot and taking plate numbers. But we can just gather, meet together, bring our requests before you right now, enjoy the, the time of fellowship as we meet, and even as we share communion this morning, together be reminded of the Savior Jesus who paid a price for our sin. So we thank you for your blessings. We ask that we might be thankful for each of these requests as answered. We pray that as we have a few moments here individually to bring our heartfelt requests to you, the ones perhaps that did not end up on a piece of paper, perhaps cannot be shared, perhaps unknown to anybody else in this room. But we trust that those things we bring before you privately will be answered in the same way that the things we prayed together for in, because we come in Jesus' name.
Okay, this morning our scripture reading is going to be from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. That's John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of, the, of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Thank you, and may the Lord virtually bless this reading of his word to our hearts. All right, we'll have our kids come forward for our children's chat this morning. All righty. So what is tomorrow? What is tomorrow? We've got all kinds of answers. The 4th of July, what's it also known as? That's, that is that. What's the other name for this? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes, it is. To, uh, yeah. You're talking in circles now. That's easy to do with me. What's the name of it? It's Independence Day. You ever hear of that, Independence Day? But really, that's not the best uh, description of it. What is tomorrow celebrate? What are we celebrating? Freedom? Well, that's true, but not exactly, but that's true. The presidents and the flag, yeah, that's a part of it. Independence, yeah. The bald eagle, you got to throw that in there. Actually, what is, why, it's, it's on the 4th of July. By the way, every country in the world has the 4th of July. Tomorrow's July 4th everywhere. If you go to another country, it's July 4th. But if you go over to our friends in Canada, you decide to take a boat across that lake, 50 miles that way, you'll get to Canada, it's going to be July 4th over there. But guess what? They're not going to be celebrating. They're going to go to work like a normal day. They're not going to have any parties. How are you going to celebrate tomorrow? Anybody going to have a picnic? How about fireworks? Anybody going to have some fireworks? Oh, okay, now we're into something, fireworks. They're not going to do that over there in Canada tomorrow because it's not a holiday for them. It's only a holiday for us here in America. Why is that? Because it is America's birthday. How many of you like to celebrate birthdays? Any birthday? Yeah, everybody likes to celebrate your birthday. You, you get toys. That's not my question. How many of you get fireworks for your birthday? Oh, nobody. <laughs> nobody gets fireworks for your birthday. America gets fireworks for our birthday. That's how we celebrate our birthday in America. Fireworks, picnics, food, family get-togethers. Really, we don't give America toys or gifts, but we, we celebrate with the fireworks because it's our birthday. Does anybody know how, what, how old America is? You, we'll even open this up to you people out there, you math whizzes. I'm not even getting answers from out there. I, I, see, I see people counting on their finger. You, you need more than your fingers and toes for this one, people. 2,000 years. No, not 2,000. You've gone way too far back. No. 
Only America was founded in 1776, meaning I believe if my math is right, 246 years. 246 years old. Anybody else out there 246 years old? I didn't think so. I hope not. <laughs> you, you, you look very good for 246 if you are, by the way. So it's our birthday. We celebrate the birthday of America tomorrow. We celebrate your birthdays. Whatever day it is, mine's in September, July, what month? Your birthday. February, what month? October, Hunter down there. What month is your birthday, Hunter? September. I'll oh, try October. <laughs> One of them months there. We celebrate our birthdays. What is the most famous birthday we celebrate? Is it America's? Yeah, you're all going to vote for America. Yeah, yeah. Don't vote for America. There's a birthday we celebrate every year that's far more famous than America. Christmas and the birthday of Jesus. It seems like a very odd day for me to read this, but let me read. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And to celebrate that birth of Jesus when it happened, what happened immediately? There were angels that came to the shepherds, announced the birth, and then the shepherds came to the manger. And we're here in July and you're saying Christmas. It's the wrong time of year, but that's the most famous birth we celebrate. It's more famous than America. It's more famous than all of you, of course, and me. It's the most famous birthday we celebrate. Now, do we know it was December 25th? Not really, because God didn't give us a day. But whatever day it was, it certainly was the most famous birth and certainly does mean that we ought to celebrate the birth of Jesus when he came to earth in that manger. So I, tomorrow's a great birthday. Enjoy the fireworks. Enjoy the picnic. Enjoy the watermelons. Whatever you're doing. But don't lose sight. As important as the founding of our country is and the birthday of our country is, the most important birthday is not mine, not yours, not even America's. It's Jesus. And so remember that if you can hold that thought till Christmas and you'll remember how important it is then. But it's also important to celebrate it today. You can head back to your uh, families. I don't believe we have enough for children's church this morning. It looks like there's two and not three, so <laughs> they don't all go. They're not all that. They're, some of them are too old. <laughs> we are in the book of John. And no, we're not going to be celebrating the birth of Jesus this morning with a message. When we come to the message today, I do want to mention July 4th, though. Uh, we're in John 4, because it doesn't get by me the most important part of the newspaper. Yes. How many people read the comics? It's the most important part of the newspaper. Come on. You, come with me here. You've got to get with me. So in today's comics, you may have read it already. Uh, anybody familiar with Garfield? That, that orange little cat, remember him? Well, Garfield and John, who is his owner... And, of course, there's Garfield's uh, friend, o o Opie the dog. And they're all in this picture with John's girlfriend. And she's a vet, but I don't remember her name, and they don't give her name very often. John is getting ready for the 4th of July barbecue. And he's standing there. Now, let's try not to get hungry as he describes this. He says, I really outdid myself for our cookout this year. For the ribs. I used a dry rub of black pepper, garlic salt, chili powder, brown sugar, and cinnamon. Then I seasoned them with apple jelly and honey. I marinated the pork chops for 12 hours in olive oil, maple syrup, balsamic vinegar, soy sauce, and that Dijon mustard. How sweet it is. Then he looks at the grill and says, but it's sure taking a long time to cook. To which his girlfriend picks up one of the pork chops and says, where's the charcoal? John says, charcoal? Then John says, charcoal! And then Garfield, on the phone, tapping a text, asks Odie, thick or thin crust? <laughs> yep, not going to be able to cook all that wonderful food without charcoal. I hope your 4th of July picnic goes a little better than Garfield's. 
When we come to a holiday like the 4th of July, people have, like all holidays, traditions. Traditions are important to humanity. No matter what culture, what country, what place you're from in this world, humanity develops traditions. It's a very interesting thing uh, how traditions take over without many years of having them. When we were in our last church in Fort Ann, one of our traditions was our annual picnic was at a state park on the 4th of July. Uh, we did deviate from that on a year that Sunday and the 4th came together, but uh, we would always have our picnic on the 4th of July, and it became a tradition. We moved here, and it's like, we should be at the picnic, you know, where all the church people were, but that wasn't the case. But we developed in those years a tradition. Uh, we have things that are traditional that you might have. Fireworks are a tradition. You know, many of you go to the fireworks the same time, same place every 4th of July. It's a tradition. The cookouts might be a tradition. A uh, lot of things are traditional in our worlds. And when you come to Jesus' worlds, there were a lot of things that were traditions or traditional. And what we find today when we come to John chapter 4 is the traditions of Jesus' day, he broke them in this chapter. This chapter is the great breaking of tradition that Jesus is somewhat regularly able to do. First of all, as we read this passage, Jesus is going to interact with a woman. And that woman is in Samaria. Jesus was going between Jerusalem and Galilee, cutting through Samaria. That, first of all, defied tradition. The Jewish people did not go through Samaria. They despised the Samaritans. They didn't like them at all. They would go around Samaria from north to south. They just didn't go through there. It's like, for instance, uh, and not that we despise anybody from Westfield, but it's like if you did to drive to Mayville, to drive around Westfield, to drive back down to Ripley, because you were not going through Westfield. I won't be seen there. So you go all the way around. That's quite a commitment with the price of gas these days, to go all the way around. But the Jewish people did that as a tradition. They didn't go through Samaria. They would go the long way. And they were doing it on the backs of not gas, but on the backs of walking and their feet. That's how much they did not enjoy Samaritans. But Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He left Judea in verse 3, and he went, as it says in verse 4, right through Samaria. Uh, and so he's on his way through Samaria. He comes to a well. The Samaria that was in the midst of the nation of Israel was once a part of Israel. You see, the Samaritans were a separate people group by this time because after one of the Old Testament dispersions of the northern kingdom, where a lot of their folks were taken away in judgment, those that were left intermarried with the Canaanites and other people who were there. And by this time of Jesus' coming, they had lost their ethnic purity of being Jewish. And that's why the Jewish people didn't like them. As a matter of fact, rabbinic law of the day stated that if you even spoke to a Samaritan woman who was considered unclean, period, you as a Jew would not be clean. Some didn't take it that far and said if you only ate with them or were with them in some other manner other than discussion, you wouldn't be able to celebrate worship at the temple until you went through a cleansing. That's how bad they thought the Samaritans were. The Jews basically hated the Samaritans. And here's Jesus. He's going to first cut right through Samaria. It is quicker. It is faster. It is more prudent. If you want to get there fast, it's the easiest way to go. But it's taxing. And he gets to this well, and his disciples go off to find provisions, and he is thirsty. And at this well is this Samaritan woman. And in verse 7, he asks her to give him a drink, defying the tradition that he shouldn't even be talking to her. Tradition says, don't talk to that woman. She's a Samaritan. And yet, here he is. He's not only talking to her, he asks her to help him and get him some water. Now, why would he ask? Isn't Jesus capable of turning a faucet on? <laughs> well, there's no faucets there to turn on. You see, if you're going to draw water out of a dugout spring, or well, as they call it there, you need one little thing. 
You need something to put your water in. And what did Jesus obviously not have? He did not have any vessel, any container to drop into this well and pull out water. I mean, we all know Boy Scouts were taught that you can get water in your hand and like a dog or a cat, you know, get a drink. But it's real hard when the water is down 10 foot to do that. There's only one way to get at water that's down 10 foot. We all know what that is. And it's frowned upon when it's a public well. That's jumping in. Uh, so and that's not a good thing to do. So Jesus defies tradition and asks her to help him get water. She's there to get water. She has a vessel. She has a container. She's going to dip down and get water for herself, probably for her animals. It was a typical day. She probably did this every day and came to this well to get water for the family, water for their animals. This was how you got water. How many people now love being an American with running water? Aren't you, aren't you glad about that? You know, It makes you just a little better feeling this morning. Well, that's not the case for them. So he approaches her, and she is astonished that this Jewish man would actually ask her to get water for him. And that's the reply in verse 9. How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Certainly don't ask them for favors and for, for them to do something for them. Uh, this ethnic background is a breaking of the tradition that Jesus should even be asking this woman. The Jewish rabbinical lawyers and law interpreters and scribes would say he should go thirsty rather than ask a Samaritan for water. He should, be, he should just sit there thirsty, wait for his disciples to get back. They've gone for food and see if they happen to think to bring some uh, uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi with them. Something. He should be thirsty. He shouldn't ask her. Jesus not only asked her for water, then he starts to interact with her, breaking all traditions of carrying on a discussion with this woman. And in verse 10, he answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give, me, give to me to drink, thou wast asked of him that he would give you living water. If you knew who was talking to you, ma'am, you would be asking me for the living water that I have. And that's going to be the basis of this discussion. Let me first look at this woman he's talking to. She's a Samaritan. We've already talked about that. In verses 17 through 19, she comes with a background that's a little bit suspicious. Uh, Jesus and interacts with her a little later, but we'll get to it now. Uh, he asks her to bring her husband. We'll see why in a few moments. And, you know, she replies she didn't have one of them. And Jesus says, indeed you don't. You've had five. She's been married five times in series. And now she's with another guy who's not her husband. She hasn't had a very good family life. Uh, no matter how you slice this or cut it or look at it, something is not really great with her family life. Uh, she certainly has had trials. I wonder how many children she's had from various marriages. Uh, her family life looks a lot like family lives look today, don't it? You know, five divorces, five husbands, and now with a guy she's not married to. This would make the average Jew faint. The average Jewish person would say, once you find this out, Jesus, there's only one thing to do. Run. Don't talk to this woman. You get away from her. She is not to be talked to. That would be the Jewish leadership view. But Jesus continues to talk to her. And he talks about her worship. Because when he tells her she had five husbands, there is no earthly way that he ever should have known that. Now, if I look around this room today... I can tell a lot of things about some of you. I can tell where you work. I know that Frank has an auto body shop. He's worked on my cars. I know he has that. It, it's no miracle if I say, Frank has an auto body shop. Everybody here and me know that. Moving back down the line, there's Skip. He's a retired machinist. Uh, now he's a retired grape farmer. I don't know what he's doing these days, uh, maybe in his recliner perhaps, but he's retired. I know that about him. Uh, it doesn't take genius to, to figure that out. I come over here to Ed, he's an electrician. Uh, we all know that. I come over here and we got this fine looking group, a few retired folks. There's a former auto body shop owner over here. He used to do that. He's now retired. And I can go around and share all these things, facts about people. And nobody is astonished, are you? How about the first time I ever showed up here back many, many years ago, and I would have come in and, and said, 
I think this guy owns an auto body shop. That might have been impressive. Frank would have asked, who tipped him off to my background? And I went around the room and told you things about your lives that I should not know. Just met you. Shouldn't be aware of any of it. That's what's happening here. There's no way Jesus should know that she'd had five husbands. He'd never met this woman before. He'd never met anybody that knew this woman before. And there's nobody there who knows this woman enough to tip him off. And he says, you are correct. You've had five husbands, and now you're with another guy. And she responds, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Because she understood immediately there's no way he should have known. And so he talks about her worship. Uh, she goes on and says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. That is the fundamental difference between the Samaritans and the Jews. Where to worship? What is worship? Where are the sacrifices brought? God said in the Old Testament they must come to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. When the northern kingdom split from the southern kingdom in your Old Testament, after King Solomon, the southern folks kept Jerusalem. It was in their turf. The northern people, to obey God, would have had to come to the southern kingdom to worship. They said, we're not going down there. We don't like those Jews in the southern kingdom anymore. We're going to worship up here. And at the time of Jesus' coming, Mount Gerizim was the place of northern worship, or the principal place. And she's trying to defend her worship. But her worship is not correct. It is not according to the law. Which Jesus then interacts with her again in verse 21. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's a whole message in and of itself that I don't have time to give to you this morning, except he continues to talk to this lady in spite of the fact that she's practicing the wrong faith. Now, the disciples get back at this point in verse 27... And they are just shocked. I don't know what provisions they found when they went into the village, but they get back here. And in verse 27, it says, And upon this came his disciples, and they marveled that he talked with the woman. And yet no man saith, What seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? They didn't even dare ask why he was talking with her. They were just astonished. In their hearts they were saying, How can he talk to this lady? How could he be speaking to this woman? What is wrong? It violates every tradition. And that's what they're thinking, though they didn't even dare say it. And they came back. There's nothing about talking with this woman that was appropriate by the traditions of Jewish times in Jesus' day. And yet Jesus talked to this woman who would have been outside of discussion with any Jewish leader, any Pharisee, scribe, Sadducee, priest, who came through Samaria and ran into this woman at that very well, would not have said two words to her, even if he needed a vessel to get water for himself. He'd have said nothing. He'd have sat there thirsty, because he would not have been allowed, nor would he have talked to this lady. But Jesus did. And Jesus talked to this lady for the point of the message that we already read back in verse 13 and 14, as he explained to her what living water is. She at first doesn't get it. In verse 11, the woman said to him, after he said, I, I have living water, she says, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep from whence thou hast thou living water. And she didn't first get it. And then he said back to her in verse 13, Whosoever drinketh of this water, pointing probably to the well, we don't know that, but he probably pointed at the water in the well, whoever drinks at this water will thirst again. Isn't that amazing? You're so thirsty. You know, you're just parched. You've been out mowing the lawn, weed whacking all afternoon in the sun. And you come into the house looking for Powerade, Gatorade, whatever it is, iced tea, lemonade. And you're ready to drink gallons of the stuff. And you drink tons of the stuff. And you're finally saying, I feel better. And you say, I never will need to drink liquids again. I'm good for the rest of my life. You know, that is true. Except your life's going to be about three days long. <laughs> if you never drink again. 
because we need to replenish regular water and regular liquids over and over and over and over. When is the time that you stop drinking liquids? When you die. And Jesus says, you, you drink of this water, you will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, verse 14, will never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And Jesus is only using earthly water as an illustration of living water, which is spiritual water, which he brings to any who call upon him as their savior. The woman in verse 15 is highly interested, and she's beginning to understand the difference of what he's talking about. That's why she replies going into her religion very shortly, the verses we just read in verses 20 and following. She said, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst not. And that's when he says, Go get thy husband. I'll give it to both of you, is the idea. And then she says, Well, I don't happen to have a husband. We looked at that. Then she talks about, I perceive you're a prophet, and we looked at that. And then he talks about worshiping God in spirit and in truth, which will happen without the Jewish temple, because guess what we do today in this church age? We worship the Lord here at West Portland Baptist Church. How? In spirit and in truth. There's no temple. There's no Jewish offerings. There's no sacrifices here this morning. No need of them. Jesus was a sacrifice once for all for sin. And we are separated and free from the ritual of the Old Testament that showed them to look to Jesus, who now that he has come, we no longer need to look to his coming. We look back upon his coming. That's communion. We look back upon what he did. And that day has come. We worship in spirit and in truth. And she is collecting these thoughts and understanding. And look at verse 25. Then the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, if those who say Jesus never ever said who he was, read verse 26. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. You say there's a Messiah coming. You say the Christ is coming. Jesus says to this woman, that's me. You walk in this morning and somebody says your name. I did. I said, hey, Lupa, because I have some work for her to do that she requested. A little bit of apple butter vendor sheets that she's going to be putting in the mail very shortly. And Lupa, what did she say? She said, that's me. Even in spite of the fact I brought her a whole stack of work, she still admitted to that being her. When you walked in this morning and somebody said, hey, and they threw your name out there, that's you. This lady says, the Messiah is coming, which is the Christ. He'll tell us all things. And Jesus said, that's me. I'm he. And she believed it. Last week, we looked at Nicodemus. They talked back and forth about spiritual birth. And we realized that Nicodemus, apparently at that point in time of that discussion, did not believe. But he would later. It is very clear that this woman did believe. What does she do once she believes? She takes this message and, you know, we're left with the disciples. She leaves her water jug behind her. Now that is a sin of sins. Your water jug is one of the most precious items you have. You just don't leave it lay around. You ever lose something important like a wedding ring? Where did I put that? Where did it come off? I had a watch on this morning and now it's missing. Where did it go? Where are my car keys? You ever lose those critters? This is something you just don't leave there. Verse 28, she left her water pot and went into the city and she got people to come because they had to see the Messiah she has believed in who's standing at this well. And this whole crowd of people come out and they all meet with Jesus and he gives them the gospel message. And in verse 39 it says, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him, and he would tarry with them and abode there two days. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his word. There was almost this little revival of people who would come to Jesus because he talked to one lady at this well. Do you understand that the message of this interaction of Jesus is sometimes the people we interact with are sinfully ugly? But don't get too caught up with that because we once were sinfully ugly. And they don't have their lives together. And maybe they have five husbands or wives currently. Who knows? 
And maybe the, as their home life is, is, is a wreck, their personal life is a wreck. Their financial life is a mess. They're addicted to some substance. The, the, the problems of humanity without Christ are longer than I can list. And there are people in the midst of those. And sometimes we have opportunity to interact with them. If it were up to the Jewish leaders, nothing would have been said. The Jewish leaders say, you don't talk to those people. You don't interact with those people. You don't even look at those people. You'll sit there thirsty before you ever ask one of those people for a drink. And Jesus comes along and interacts with this sinfully ugly lady who needed him. And he pointed it out. He pointed out her sin. He didn't soft pedal the gospel. Why do we need Christ? Because we are sinners. If you talk to somebody, why do they need Christ? Because they're a sinner. And he's the one who will save them. He's the one who will forgive them. Not you, not me, not even the message. They need to believe upon him. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we are acting in the place of Jesus. Have you noticed he's not here? He's not approaching women at wells. He's not down here talking to sinners directly face to face today. Whose job is that? It's ours. In the New Testament, it calls us the ambassadors of Jesus. The ones who represent him now. We represent his message. We represent his uh, talking to people. We talk to the ugly, the infirmed, those who are sinfully messed up. You know, this woman believes. She trusts Christ. And he gives her living water. Water that will live within her for how long? Forever. She will never thirst again. Because the water he gives is the water of the washing of forgiveness of sin through his shed blood. Though he had not yet shed it in John 4, he will, and he did. And you can be rest assured and count upon the fact that her and these other Samaritans in those two days that believed, you can look them up in heaven, they'll be there to be looked up because they have partaken of living water. And if you have faith in Christ and you have that spiritual birth that Jesus presented to Nicodemus that we looked at last Sunday, you have the spiritual water that has washed away your sin and left you without ever need of thirst again in Christ. It's interesting. That's our relationship. That's what we need. And if you've done that, the thirst is gone. The sins are forgiven. And God after that has happened, has made you his own child and welcomed you into his family. The question is, are you interacting with the women around your well? And guess what? They may not be women. They may be men at your well. They may be co-workers at your well. Who's at your well? Who's at your place of employment? Who's at the life you live? Who are those people around you that need Christ? Some of them won't want to interact with you. You can't force interaction. Some of them have no interest in living water and walk away. And you can't drag them back. But every once in a while, there's somebody at your well like this lady at Jesus' as well who's really interested in what Christ might have for them. And the only way you'll figure out whom that is gathered around your well is to interact with them because we don't have the ability Jesus had to know which one was interested. He could look at the hearts. He knew it was her. You want to know her from him or from them or from all the other people. And the only way we know who's interested is to interact. And you'll pretty quickly catch on. Those who aren't interested rise to the surface quickly and uh, are very uninterested in the gospel. At that particular time and moment, you share what little you've shared, and they walk off, and they walk off. But every once in a while, there's a woman like this one. Make sure you're the mouthpiece of Jesus to interact with him or her to share the freedom of Christ and the forgiveness of sin and the living water, which he offered, that indeed everyone who partakes of will never thirst again. Let's pray. Father, may the word of God touch our hearts. May you minister to us through it. May we be encouraged to do that which Jesus did, to interact with those who are in need of you, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Before communion this morning, we're going to sing number 201. Number 201, grace that is greater than our sin. And this is all about grace. Jesus' grace has done it all. He provided for us. Verse 2, verse 1, 2, 1, 3, and 4 of 201. I'll get us all confused. 201, 1, 3, and 4. You can stand together. You may be seated. From the Gospel of Luke this morning, we are reminded of what Jesus did. The living water that he offered to this lady that we looked at this morning came from him going to the cross and shedding his blood. And we look back because that is accomplished. In earthly time and in earthly uh, existence, this happened for us already. And so we come to these verses and we come thinking about how we interacted with Jesus, how there was a time and a place when we believed this for ourselves, how that we had that spiritual birth of Nicodemus, how we have the spiritual water granted to us from this uh, lady who was granted to it in John. And we know him. The table of the Lord, the communion table, is for believers. We come with a, a humble heart, a heart that has recognized our infirmities, recognized our sin, recognized the uh, need to confess our sin and, and be right in standing with him, though forgiven, to be in fellowship with him before we come. And then when we come, we remember what this is all about. And it is about that which he did the night before he died. It says the hour was come and he sat down with the 12 apostles with him and they would talk and they would have the Passover meal. And in the midst of that time, uh, he would do two things, one with an element of bread, the other with the element of the cup. And what he would say to them regarding the bread, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The piece of bread that he gave them that night was not his physical body. His physical body was standing there with them. Neither is this piece of bread that we will distribute his physical body. But it is a symbol, for us a reminder, of what happened to his physical body that next day as they crucified him and as they put him on the cross. He then gave them a cup. He said, Take and divide it amongst yourselves, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. 
The blood was not his, or the, the cup was not his blood, it was in his body as he was there with them. Neither is this cup his blood, but this cup is a symbol, a reminder of his blood that was shed the day after he did this with his disciples as he was on the cross. These symbols are for us who believe to remind us again that the living water promised to the woman at the well and promised to us come from an action, and that action is him giving his life on the cross for us. I'm going to ask one of our deacons to give thanks for the bread, the symbol and reminder of the body of Christ broken for our sin. Heavenly Father, we, we do come to you today and we, we thank you. We thank Jesus for, for being willing to bear the burden of the cross, let his body be broken and, and beaten, that we might receive this marvelous gift of salvation, the best gift that could ever be given. Though we do not need to be of a specific nationality, we do not need to be of a specific color, uh, he gave it for all of us, and we thank you for that, dear Jesus. Amen. Our deacons will distribute both the cup and the bread together, prepare the bread after the music as we'll partake that together first. This piece of bread reminds us of the body of Jesus. It was broken on that cross for our sin. We have living water and eternal life because it was his body broken for us. This we do remembering that event. Remember Jesus. Likewise, we will remember the Lord's blood that's shed for us. We'll have a few moments where some music for you to prepare your cup, and then together we will remember the Lord's blood shed for you and me.
This cup that is before us is a reminder of his blood that was shed from his body, that poured out upon the ground and upon the surroundings when he was upon the cross. And that was done that we might have the living water of salvation. As we partake this together, remember Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can remember our Savior, that we can remember the price that he paid, that we can remember and reflect upon how we weren't worthy or deserving. It was not owed to any of us. It is but a wonderful free gift of grace and mercy that you loved us so much that you came to this earth to provide the ultimate price for our penalty, to pay what we deserve to have paid, and to pay it in your body, broken and bleeding, and for us. May we thank you for what you've done for us. In Christ's name, amen. We'll close our service this morning with, as soon as I find it, number 506. 506. Standing together, number 506 in your hymnal. I will sing of my Redeemer, verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4 of 506. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful to having the opportunity to be here, to think about your word, to be blessed by that which is found within it, to be challenged, perhaps to find those who are around our wells that need to hear of the living water of Jesus, and to then share a time when we remember that living water of Jesus was applied to our lives when we came in simple faith and trust and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you gave your life, and died for us. May that blessing that we've shared in this time together carry throughout this week in our hearts and lives to inspire us, to encourage us, to minister to us, to allow us to more closely follow you, and to give you a, a praise and thanks for all that you're worthy and deserving of in our lives. And we'll leave here this day praying for a safe journey to our homes, praying for those who are traveling over this holiday weekend that in all of these circumstances of earthly travels, you will keep us in your care, and we'll thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
And don't forget to sign up for next Sunday's lunch on the bulletin board. Well, George, you're, you're, you're hooked.